Hi guys, um, it's Ellie here from the Earth's History is Confusing. I just wanted to share with you something that I've been to before, but I had no idea that they were here in Australia, is the star forts. We seem to call them batteries, or we don't call them forts, but we seem to just call them batteries. Um, now, this one I was talking about is Scratchley, is in um, Newcastle, named after um the major general um on the first of october 1882 employed as defense advisor by the colonel office he was appointed special commissioner for great britain and new guinea in 1884 right there in august 1885. Um, he was created a knight commander of the order of saint michael and saint george Scratchley Road in Port Moresby, Mount Scratchley in the Allen Range near Kokoda in Papua New Guinea, and Fort Scratchley in Newcastle are named in his honour. Now, Fort Scratchley, sorry, I had a whole heap of um, tabs here ready to go, but I'm a little bit all over the place, so just hang in there with me. It's really the first time I've done anything like this, so. Okay, I've lost it. Okay. So. Let's go, is it this way, this way? Oh, the thing here, okay. Okay, here we are. Fort Scratchley. Okay, Fort Scratchley, a formal coastal defence installation, is now a museum. It's located in Newcastle East, a suburb of Newcastle, New South Wales, in Australia. Built in 1882 to defend the city against possible Russian attack. Now, I don't believe that narrative. I really don't. Russia had enough going on in that time to... Um, bother about claiming land in Australia that they had no interest in. Um, guns were not fired in anger until 8th of June 1942 during the shelling of Newcastle. The Australian Army left the site in 1972. Fort Scratchy was situated on top of Flagstaff Hill overlooking the Tasman Sea and Hunter River, less than one kilometre from Newcastle Central Business District. Um, it's accessed from Nobby's Road and there's Nobby's Beach. Nobby's Beach is just down below Fort Scratchy. Um, 2004, the site was closed for renovation, uh, but it's open again. I went there last year, um, and I also went there with a child. Um, Flagstaff Hill is where coal was discovered in the late 18th century. The twin of John Shortland have come upon the land while looking for rogue criminals. Here, but his pursuits were unsuccessful and instead found fragments of coal at the base of the hill of Flagstaff Hill continued to be home for the coal exploration throughout the early 19th century until the army claimed the land in 1843. Plans for a complete fort were not made until after 1870 when the threat of an attack by Russia began spreading through Newcastle due to the increased hostility between England and Russia. The fort was finally finished in 1882. The Russians were no longer a threat. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> a battery of two a uh, 32-pounder SB cannons were placed upon Allen's Hill in 1866. Two 68-pounders were placed in 1874. On the 1st of April 1878, pre uh, preparations, begin for the preparations begin for the installation of a battery of four 80-pound guns upon Allen's Hill and completed in, on the 19th of April. Um, <laughs> the fort was completed on the 2nd of April, 1882. It was designed by Lieutenant Colonel Peter Scratchley, after whom the fort was named and included three 9-inch rifle muzzle loader guns, RML guns, and a Christmas battery of four 80-pounders in 1889. Three 6-inch BL and 188BL Desprim guns were installed. The 80-pounders were replaced by quick fire and mordant machine guns in 1898. 26 BL Mark BLS were replaced by four disappearing guns in 1847. During World War I, the fort was upgraded with provisions of a battery outpost constructed in 1940. Uh, fort Scratchley showing the dry moat that surrounds the structure. So, yep, there's the dry moat. And it's actually a star fort. I don't believe that yeah, Scratchley built it. I believe he came across it and renovated it. Okay, so post World War during World War the fort was upgraded with the extension of the battery observation post. Searchlight directed station and ballast walls were constructed in nineteen forty two. The two six inch BL Mark seven is it five and two. Guns were fired at Japanese submarine one two one and then shelled the city um, 
8th of June 1942. After World War II, the fort was home to 13th Medium Coast Battery, a unit of the National Service Scheme, which was renamed 113th Coast Battery RA in the 1960s. The Army left the site in November 1972. Um, so let's check out their map. What's scratchy map? Okay, so this is like a brochure that you get from them, a hard copy of it. So we can clearly see here this is where the moat used to be. This has all been filled in now, it goes all around up here, down. Around. It's, it's a star fort, and they say it is. So, tall entrance. This is right above a row of buildings. It's a real shame that they've um, filled it all in a lot of the places. It's been covered up. The fort is over 130 years old and has areas that may present any resources. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is the other one I was. There's several I was looking at now. I, I didn't realise that Australia actually had star forts until Global Vision pointed out one down in. Um, South Australia. So I've um, come across several more since I think that, and I want to thank Global Vision for bringing this to my attention. So, um, Fort Lytton is an important historic site built in 1881 and used for the defence of Brisbane until the end of the Second War. It is a pentangular, pentangular force concealed behind grassy embankment so it's all been filled in like the others all get filled in okay Fort Lytton uh, main part now I've done a video on this already it's up on my YouTube channel if you want to check it out okay uh, Fort Lytton was constructed in 1880 to 81 oh my goodness so like a year yeah okay um, to protect the city from a port uh, from a naval attack after the Australian colonies become a federal uh, Commonwealth of Australia in 1901, the fort and the land which it stood was transferred to the Commonwealth. Fort Lytton continued to operate as a military base, a military base until shortly after the Second World War II, closed down progressively, and the last operation closed being the signal station closed in 1965. The land and the fort were sold to Ampol Oil Company in 1963. The site for new oil refinery, now Caltex Refinery, the land contained three parcels that had particular historic significance and I am grateful that this company didn't actually demolish it when they could have. Um, there was land containing the original fort um, and land containing Lytton Hill and land containing the remains of World War II heavy anti-aircraft battery. In 1988, Ampol transferred the parcel containing the original fort to the Queensland government and the Fort Lytton, this became the Fort Lytton National Park in 1990. This is one of two adjacent precincts of Fort Lytton National Park. The other one is a quarantine station. Um, its main attraction of the park is open free on Sundays and most public holiday and special occasions. They actually fire the guns there um, sometimes as well. So if you go on the right day, you'll catch the guns being fired. Um, it's, it's now a museum and there's lots of really, really interesting pieces there. Really interesting. Um, lots of photographs that were turned into a video on my profile if you want to check it out. So, here we got another one. Bear Island is a heritage list listed island located in southeast Sydney in La Perouse in the city of uh, Rainwick, local government. Um, the site is located about 16 kilometres, 9.9 .9 miles southeast of Sydney Central District, uh, district um, containing former fortification facilities. Um, Bear Island was a former war veterans home and museum is now a historic site added to the Heritage Register. Um, it was designed by Sir Peter Scratchley which is the guy that we just looked at with the other fort, Scratchley Fort. So, I've got so many open, sorry. Um, Bear Island is connected by a footbridge to the main La Perouse, the heritage listed military fort and tunnels can only be visited by a guided tour. The waters around the island are popular with scuba divers. Okay. So this is La Perouse. 
And it's obviously another star fort that um, us Australians have had no idea about it. So, I'm trying to see where it is. Goodness. So, that's a very old. I'll leave the links up in the um, descriptions with this. Um, if there's something that I've missed, just um, don't get grumpy. Just let me know in the comments and um, I'll get back to it and sort it out. Um, so, the fortification of Phillips facilities. Um, the construction of the Bear Island Fort was completed in 1885 at a cost of £34,000. Work inside the fort began in 1989. So I, I really doubt these dates. I really do. It just... Uh. So the outside was finished within, what, four years? And then the rest began. It took another four years. Um... Now, I was looking into the architects of all these palaces and buildings. They, they just seem to, they, they seem to have this massive amount that they've done and there's just no way they could have done it. Like, transportation, how, how did they get from city to city, city like that when, when there was just no roads and thick bush and prickly pear cactus everywhere? They're just, there's just no airplanes. There's just no way physically. They, you know, the only way to be about ship and then have to walk in on the land, but just no way physically. And then how did they move the materials? It's just, I don't, don't know. Okay, Bear Island is a low sandstone island, about 30 metres, 98 feet from the shore of the southern end of the La Perouse headland near the entrance of Botany Bay. The island has been completely altered from its natural profile. The fortification complex comprises a battery, barracks buildings, parade, courtyard, Access to the bridge, laboratory rooms, guards quarters. The fabric of the complex is best described in relation to the six phases of occupation identified by Gojak. Um, phase 1, 1880 to 1890, original fortification works by McLeod. Includes all major concrete work, earthworks, the bridge, the original space, foundations, finishings, characteristic materials, uh, mass concrete with sandstone aggregate, cement render, cream fire brick, Cheddar pattern slope grazed tiles under salt of sulfate, some reinforcing armor plate used vaulting to span tunnels and much of the timber detailing seen in Law's conservation plan. Phase two, 1890 to 1912, second phase fortification work by Dawalski and others, primarily before 1894. Includes many mainly the barracks and the installation of a hydro pneumatic gun. Characteristic materials include concrete with finer blue stone aggregate. Reinforcing beams to span voids, some conduit, red tun tun tuck point brickwork, tuck point, ah, tuck ta, tuck ta ta ta, brickwork with dressed sandstone, coins and intels. What's this, coins? Uh, mostly blocks at the corner of the wall, some are structural, providing strength. Okay. Structure and intels. There's a structural horizontal block that spans the space of opening between the two vertical supports. It can be a direct architectural element or combined ornamental structure element. So it would have been structure for a building like this. Phase 3, 1960, 1912 to 1963 was a war veterans home. Primarily around 1912 and the second phase of activity in 1939. Includes minor modifications all areas of fort. Characteristic materials includes paint finishes, timber flooring, Inside storeroom, some conduits, cabling, alterations to original uses of spaces, removed to removal of internal wall changes also made to the barracks, opening up new access passages and circulation routes. Um, no definitive evidence of this period beyond possible painted signage for phase uh, four, phase five, Bandrick Historical Society Museum is what it became in 1963-1975. And phase six, um, all characteristics made since Randwick Historical Society vacated the Lower Island mainly constitutes, constitutes large scale repair and conservation work to retaining walls, barracks, veranda, the roof, all 
cesspit draining system removal of more recent additions and provision of safety works. Um, as of 2000, the archaeological potential to reveal information is not available from other sources about the construction and the use of the fort is high, as in is the potential to derive information that cannot be found on its other sites. The toughness is high, the structure remains enough of the original fabric to enable its form, functions, interrelationships to be easily established. The integrity of the complex is high, Mass most facets of the structure and its functions survive. This is just unreal that, you know, in 1885, right, bridge repairs, then 1993, structure repairs, 1997, major console. Well, so, like, it hasn't had much done to it since that time. It's just unreal. So, um, 18th of May 2010, it became heritage listed, where it should have been heritage listed a long time before that. Um, yeah, now it's important recognition. So, special control. Okay, so let's check out some photos. So, this is facing southeast. Will it be zooming in for me or not? I don't know. Oh, cool. Okay, so it's had a little bit of work done to it since. Obviously, it is star for, and so much has been hidden from us. We need to start asking questions and looking for the truth. It's really frustrating. Okay, is it doing this again? Okay. Okay, a view of Botany Bay as the first fleet entered. Okay. With Bear Island in the background. Images from a journal from Arthur Phillip. Uh, I bet you that on that island... It's already there, it's just covered up with trees. Zoom in. Goodness, okay. Alright, next one. Okay, so this will be the other side. I actually went past this when I. Um, at the ferry and went to Manly on the ferry. It was a lovely boat ride. Okay, so this is the back of it. Head on the sandstone rock. Cool. Alright. Okay, so I'll put them links in a little bit here. Okay, that's Port Scratchley, Fort Lytton. Okay, Fort Lytton here in Arm. 13 hectares, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, here, yeah, I just want to show. Um, about a hectare of colonial buildings, tunnels, and other fortified structures embedded in a protective earth mound wall surrounded by a 10 metre wide water filled moat. Okay, so the moat's all dried up now and they've all changed it. It's totally different now. Um, check out my video, you'll see. Oh, okay, I'm back to Portland. Sorry, it's all messed up. Okay, so. There's an image of Fort Lytton. Um, the rest is either back here, buried, um, and they haven't uncovered it, or they've demolished it. Okay. So Port Lytton, Fort Lytton, a pentagular earthwork fortification located at the mouth of Brisbane River, constructed in 1880, 1882 by the Queensland Government on the British advice of the British military engineers, uh, Colonel Sir W. F. D. Jarvis and Lieutenant Colonel Scratchley. The fort contributed to the coastal defence of Queensland until the end of the Second World War. Um, now, once again, we've got these dates here. Now, how was he building up here in Queensland when he was in Newcastle building and also in South Australia building? Um, it, the, the distances are just unreal. Like, Brisbane to South Australia is well, probably four days drive as it is. <laughs> Not quite four days, but... Um, it's roughly, probably about 3,000 kilometres, 3,700 kilometres, Brisbane to Adelaide, roughly. So it's a bit of a drive, um, 
it's even today, so I don't know how we would have got there. Um, it was a quarantine station during the um, arrival of the fleet. So I'm just going to close some of these because I'm getting confused. Let me go for the uh, Port Scratchley again. Yeah, I just don't get the dates. I mean, 1882, built in 1882, but in 18, when you go back to Fort Lytton, it's, you know, being built at the same time. It's so, same as, like, it just doesn't make sense as to how one can build. So he built all of these, well, his plans. Um, he was over in, um, born in Paris. And um, educated in Paris at the Woolwich Academy, um, officer of engineers in the British Army, served in Crimea and Indian Mutiny. Um, in October 1859, was made captain. He had several tours of duty in the Australian colonies. So, following the withdrawal in 1870 of the British garrison troops from Australia, Major General Sir William Jarvis. And then Lieutenant Colonel Scratchley were commissioned by a group of colonies to advise on defence matters. They inspected each colony's defences and produced the Jarvis Scratchley reports of 1877. Not surprisingly, given their engineering backgrounds and the fear in the colonies of potential enemy attacks, the reports emphasised provocations against the naval attack. The Jarvis Scratchley reports formed the basis of the defence planning in Australia and New Zealand for the next 30 years. Among his achievements in Australia were founding of the Corps of Engineers in Victoria in 1860, the Fort of Bear Island, Botany Bay, New South Wales, Fort Scratchley, New South Wales, Newcastle, Fort Lytton, Brisbane, Queensland, Fort Granville, South Australia, assisted by Alexander Bain Moncliffe. Now, he was the one that uh, so-called architect that stayed on site and built it. Fort Queenscliff in Victoria. Um, now, look at the beautiful red brick building of this. It's just gorgeous. It's, um, Australia has a lot of beautiful buildings. Okay. Um, Forts Cliff, Queensland, in Victoria, Australia, dates from the 1860s when an open battery was constructed on the Shortlands Bluff to defend the entrance to Port Phillip. The fort underwent major redevelopment in the 1870s and the 1880s, become the headquarters for an extensive chain of forts around Port Phillip Heps. Its garrison included volunteer armies, infantry, and naval matilia. matilia. It was manned on the coastal defence installation consistently from 1883 to 1946. Other fortifications and armaments around the heads were completed by 1891, together with Port Phillip, uh, one of the most heavily defended ar harbours in the British Empire. So the first Allied shots of World War I were fired when a gun at Fort Nepean, another one in Victoria, um, fired across the bow of a German freighter. Now at this time they were also up in Trial Bay, up at Canterbury. There was a lot of German um, prisoners put in war. I'll try and do a video on that one for you guys as well. Um, beautiful site, and I don't believe the convicts built that site either. It's just, you, they can't read right, and yet they can follow architectural plans. Yeah. In 1852, the Lieutenant Governor J.C. Latrobe, now Latrobe University is named after him, obviously, which is the South Australian Youtube University. Um, the first settlement was proclaimed Queenscliff on the 2nd of June, 23rd of June, uh, 1853. Two months later, the first two town lots were sold. Prior to these developments, between 1838 and 1843, pilot operations had begun. Grazing lease had been granted and a lighthouse had been established in the area. Oh, cool. Didn't know I had a lighthouse there. Queenscliff High Lighthouse. Cool. That's another one I'm going to look into, um, is the, the lighthouses, um, running on mercury. And, um, also the mercury phosphorus lighting that we use on the streets. So I'm going to leave the links for you guys to um, have a read of all this. It's just too much to go through it now. Um, here we go. The building of the battery required construction of new lighthouses in 19, 1861. Contracts were let for the lighthouses to be replaced. The timber frame uh, leading light built in 1854 and badly decaying sandstone upper light. 
Both new lighthouses were built on dressed basalt. By February 1863, they were operational. The timber light was stopped and subsequently re-erected at Port Lonesdale. And the first Port Lonesdale lighthouse. Okay, lovely, beautiful lighthouses all around Australia. In 1862 to 63, the lighthouse keepers' quarters were erected uh, at the bluff, for both Queensland lighthouses. Um, the upper quarters still survive within the fort between 1864 and 79. The rate of military construction at Queen's Cliff declined. In 1870, the last detachment of British troops left Victoria and debate on the colony differences remained unsolved and the future of Queen's Cliff Battery was by no means certain. Okay, by 1886, Port Phillip was the most heavily fortified port in the southern hemisphere. Over the next 50 years, the bay forts were manned. Both Fort Nepean and Fort Queenscliff were fully operational during both world wars. Okay. So I, I hope someone else will come along and put these. I'm, I'm currently researching and doing a, a big study at the moment. It's taken me probably about eight or nine months. i um, been studying archives, certain islands, certain um, things that went on, and it's really, really interesting. Okay, I have got some evidence and um, I'm just sort of still building this because I want to have it right. Okay, so yeah, you guys can have a read of all that. Um, I'll leave all the links in the description, it's just going to be too long a video otherwise. Okay, so this is Fort Lytton again. Okay, so built in 1880, 82. Um, once again, I don't believe these dates. Um, it also had a submarine net that went across the river in the, um, Second World War for the American submarines. They were up in our river hiding and, um, yeah. Okay. There's a few photos here. Not really of ones I'm looking for, but I was looking for ones where you could really clear see the fort. The submarine line. Okay. So this is one port. Um, this is the other one in South Australia that was being built at the same time. Um, another heritage listed, protected, um, so Jarvis and Scratchley. Um, built after more than 40 years of indecision over the defence of South Australia. It was the first colonial fortification in the state. Construction of the fort began in 1878. It was officially opened in October 1880. It was completed by 1882. Now these dates, once again, don't match. Due to the changes in Port River shipping management, Port Largs surpassed it. So Port Largs is a historic defence site in the seaside suburb of Taparu near Port Adelaide, approximately 18 kilometres, 11 miles north at west of Adelaide centre. In the 1960s it was repurposed for the South Australian Police Academy. Um, the fort was largely unused and had no defence significance. Um, it's had a variety of uses, including accommodation, a caravan park, a Boy Scout campsite. Um, so once again, I'll leave the descriptions in here for you guys to check out. Let's just looking to show you some photos quickly. I did have some photos for it. Ah, here. Yeah. Okay, so this is Fort Largs. This is the other one that's just down a little bit from it. Now, this has got a little train that goes from one to the other. Maybe someone in the area that knows might be able to give me a bit more information. I'm not quite sure about it. Beautiful house. 
Is that a light? Or is it an antenna? What is it? And how did the light work back then if it wasn't power? Yes, I agree. Okay. Got that mail there. I didn't seem to find any aerial photographs of it. It's just side photographs. Uh, it looks like it's had a moat in it as well. Oh, uh, there's one. Did I go too fast? There. Okay. So Fort Glendale. Here's a photo of it here. It's obviously another star fort that's been cut up and destroyed. And there's that there and that. So it's been cut in half, basically. So. That's that one. Okay, Fort Largs is the one down, um, sort of like opposite. Um, you know, once again, Scratchley built it, so how did he build it? You know, like in the late 1800s, the visits of Russian ships in self strained waters were of friendly nature, but the Russian Turk Turkish War, 1877 78, was seen by the British as a potential expansion plan by the Russian Empire to India. And the Australian colonies were revised. No, I don't think so. They had enough to worry about at the time. Um, work began in 1882 on what was first known as the Port Adelaide Battery. It's the same specification as Fort Glendale. Its barracks and rear defence wall were finished in 1885. Emphasis for the defence of Adelaide coast shifted to Fort Largs by 1888-1899. Fort Largs was equipped with two 6-inch breech-loading disappearing guns, which outraged Greenbells. Outrage Green Bells Army. Due to this and um, changes in the Port River and shipping movements, Fort Larks has surpassed Fort Glenvale and strategic importance by 1890. In 1984, the fort was entered as a state heritage place in the South Australian Heritage Register. Um, once again, I'll leave the links in the um, description. Fort Queenscliff is that one. Okay, so the population around this time, okay, so. This is the Australian census population. So now, 1890. Okay, so 1,692,831 males. A lot of them were convicts. Um, so, where did they get the people resources to build this? I just don't get like how. how the population just goes up. Right. So this is Trial Bay, the one I was talking about. You guys should, um, I'll, I'll do another video on this later. This was where German immigrants were kept, prisoners were kept. Um, All the wooden stuff is gone. Beautiful big building. You walk through. That's the top of it. So yeah, I'm sorry if this video is long. It's the first time I'm really doing one like this. So just um. If you got uh, any suggestions on how I can improve the videos or anything like that, that please let me know. Okay. So I think that's almost it. I'll just quickly here go this one and show you this photo. Trove. Um, yeah, so I've been studying trial by. Okay, there's one quickly I want to mention is Fort Denison in New South Wales, Sydney Harbour. Um, now, it's one of these, um, it's called a Martello Tower. Um, and it's, um, it's the only one in Australia, apparently. But it was officially opened in 1857. Um, stone work, um, work began in 1855. The island into fortification as part of the program. Um, so, 1850 to the external threats to Sydney were from Russia. 
between Britain was at war in Crimea. I don't really think Crimea. Okay. So these are Metallo Towers now. Australia only really has one apparently from this map that was down here in Sydney, but they're all over the world. Hey? Mauritius, South Africa, Sierra Leone, Island of Jersey, Ireland, Britain, Sicily, Sri Lanka, Jamaica, Bermuda, um, United States, Canada. So they're all over um, the place. Yeah. This is supposed to be. Um, this is not St. Helena Island. It's supposed to be similar design in the fort. And I just sort of wanted to share my thoughts that all these places have the same design now. Okay, so here are the forts in Australia. Um, you want to take a screenshot, go for it. Um, I'll leave the links to this guy here. He's great. He's got a site, like a blog spot site. It's great. Oh, the Opera House. Now, before the Opera House was built, it had um, a site of a similar to a star fort. Um, and it was then used as a tram museum, and then suddenly it, I think it burnt down. All the trams seemed to burn down in Australia just overnight. It happens. So um, I was just looking for this photo I saw before to show you. Okay, so here we go. Right. And we've got the. Oh, that's in there. Okay, so we've got the, the designs like that. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, oh, this is one other thing I wanted to quickly share. Uh, scratchy, scratchy board. Um, Now, I just want to show you quickly a time clock. Someone said the other day they weren't quite sure of, of what they were. Um, Sorry about this, I should have had it up ready. I did have one up before, it's gone. Um, time clock is where it basically has a ball at the top of it, and when it... Um, okay, so this one here, I see this rises to the top at 1pm, and then it goes down slowly, so the, the ships are, because they had... Um, chromometers and they watch chromometers or heavy so they were um, so they would set their chromometers at um, in that thing so um, yeah once again that building looks like it's got a, a level on street windows on street level as well this building behind was damaged pretty bad and it's all been braced from the earthquake that happened in 87 yeah. okay there it is there. So it goes up, one o'clock comes down. Okay, so yeah, um, thanks for hanging around if you're here this long. I appreciate it. And if you've got any advice, please let me know. All right, guys, see ya.